Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Carly, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator at the Southern Alberta Jubilee Auditorium. Welcome to our first Mindful November workshop. I'm so excited to see all, almost 200 of you classes, 200 classes from all over Alberta. We're so excited that you're here. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a quick minute to acknowledge that we are all gathered here in what we now call Alberta, which is comprised of the Treaty 6, 7, and 8 territories. We want to honor and acknowledge all of the First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous people who have lived and traveled and gathered on these lands for thousands of years. We have a couple quick things to let you know. This is a video. You can pause it as you need to. As we go along, pause, press play when you're ready and come back and join us. If you have any questions for Valerie or if you have any answers to any of the questions that Valerie asks, please pop them in the chat here on YouTube and I will get them to her. I'm so excited to introduce you to Valerie. So please, without any further ado here, please welcome Valerie Pesnawatch Laverne. Oh, Valerie, you're still muted. There. I am. Um, good morning, uh, Kwe Kwe everyone. My name is Valerie Pesnawatch Laverne, and I currently live in um, Barrie, Ontario. Uh, the home of the Ojibwe, and I'm actually just in an area where the Ojibwe used to come bring their boats and settle just kind of in my backyard. So it's very sacred land around here. So I just want to welcome everyone. This is a, um, a real honor for me to do this um, workshop with all of you today. I hope everyone is having a good week so far. Um, it is a little bit sunny, a little overcast here in Barrie, Ontario, uh, but it's very, um, you know, we're going into the fall. So I just wanted to share with you um, all today, this morning, um, a little PowerPoint, and then I'm going to also, the, you'll get to know me a little more um, and the work that I do, and then I'm going to be sharing um, the seven grandfather teachings, which are very important to not only me personally, but professionally in the work that I do. Um, and then we're going to get you to make a piece of art based on that, um, on that, on those teachings. So, so I'm going to bear with me. Um, Zoom, I'm getting better at Zoom, but sometimes it can be a little glitchy. So I'm going to just do the share screen to get my PowerPoint going. So let me see here. All right. And I'm going to try and get this um, into... There we go. View, and I'm gonna do fit to window. And let's see here. Oh, cancel. Okay, I'm just gonna bring this up and then, okay, there we go. I hope everyone can see that. There we go. Thanks for your patience, everyone. So this is a PowerPoint because, that I wanted to share because um, I teach for a school in Winnipeg called the Wheat Institute. You can search that online. I'm one of the instructors and um, I teach several courses. And the one that I really enjoy teaching is this one called Studio One. So what I do is I teach online. Like I said, I'm learning how to use Zoom. Um, and I teach uh, Indigenous students that want to go into the work that I do. And I'll explain a little more to everyone, what does Valerie Pesnawatch do, right? Um, so we're just going to go to my other slide. And this is a quote you may or may not have heard. Um, and this really speaks to me. Uh, Louis Riel, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm sure if some of you know who Louis Riel is. And this was a quote that he had um, created back in 1885. And he said that my people will sleep for 100 years, but when they awake, it will be the artists who give them their spirits back. And art is in my work and in my beliefs, art is part of who we are. 
You don't have to be amazing. You don't have to know how to sing really well or dance really well or paint really well. As long as you are making art or music or dance or something creative, you are in line with the creator, with creation, with God, with higher source, whatever it is to you, whatever your belief system is, whether, you know, whatever your religion is, whatever your belief, maybe you're someone that just believes in nature, or maybe you just believe in, you know, love and and goodness, but that's being in line with creation and with source. So Louis, Louis Rial was saying in this quote, that we will wake up again, when we get back to that creativity again. So that's what I do is I help people get back in touch with their creativity. So here's another slide. Um, And I always say that I work from my heart. And we'll talk about that today. When we go into the, um, the love teaching, you know, one of the grandfather teachings, which I think is really important, especially right now in the world. And so I just say that I work from my heart and that one of my elders, who's no longer here, he passed on, he's in the spirit world. He passed away, he died. Um, My elder Frank DeConte told me, Valerie, always when you go to work with the people, check your heart. If it is full of anger or if you're feeling jealousy or or hate, or anything like that, try to clear that out. It doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that we need to not bring that to people. We have to clear it out ourselves, get that, who are we, who are we feeling hate towards? What, what's the anger there? Like, we got to learn to just put these things outside of ourselves and work from a place of love and connection. And I think we all know what it feels like when we when we do feel close to someone, when we do feel connected and we're getting along and we're having a good time together, that is working from a place of love. So this is um, my Indigenous side. This here is my mom holding me when I was a little one. Uh, I wasn't, I think I was maybe one years old, so younger than everyone here. Um, And this is my mother. Her name is Elizabeth or Liz, she goes by. And um, her Indigenous name, which I use now, is Pesnawatch. And interestingly enough, I had an elder tell me several years ago that that means he who listens. And that's what I do a lot in my work. I use art and my hearing and my heart to help people. So I listen to people. I listen to how they're feeling. Um, I listen to, you know, what kind of dreams they have. Because a lot of the time, a lot of us don't have someone to hear us. And it's really important that we are, we are heard. I'm not talking about going out and yelling all the time, but I'm certainly saying that if we have things that are bothering us or we just were excited about something, hey, you know, I'm going to be going to my friends for the weekend and we're going to be, you know, and, and you're excited. It's important that people see that, you know, you're excited about that. So my mother is an Algonquin from the uh, Pigwognagon First Nation in Ontario, which is just a little northwest of Ottawa. And Ottawa is actually Algonquin territory. And the Parliament buildings actually are on a burial site of our ancestors. So just a more recent picture. That's an older one, too, but this is my mom and I. And I also have one son. Um, This is an older picture. He's little. He was little here, maybe around your age or a bit. I don't know. uh, But here he is a young person. And uh, so um, he is someone that identifies as Algonquin too. And here's a more recent picture of him and I. And here is a picture of my grandfather, who was a chief in our community. And his name was Frank Baptiste Pesnawatch. And his name, the family name Baptiste, are what the missionaries gave our family. 
So maybe sometime you might, you've talked about this, or you may talk about when the missionaries, the Christian missionaries came to the communities and gave the community, like the communities, Christian names. So the one they gave us or our family was Baptiste, but our original names, original indigenous name before they came here was Pesnawatch, he who listens. This is a picture of my husband on the on one side of an elder and there's me and the elder in the middle, his name was Grandfather William. And he was an amazing man. He passed away several years ago. He died. He went to the spirit world. Uh, but he is someone that taught me a lot about my culture, about healing, about ceremony, and about learning to be connected to others through love. Because he really believed that we are one human family, every one of us. Doesn't matter what our skin color is, where we come from in the world, what our language is, what our religion is. We are one human family. And I, to this day, when I work with anybody and even, you know, how I feel towards people in, you know, in my life, you are my brothers and my sisters. So here's grandfather again with another grandmother from Mexico, and she passed this year um, uh, to the spirit world. And she was had the same idea. She was an elder and a medicine person who is someone that does healing, helps people feel better. And she was from Mexico, and they became really good friends. And they would travel around the world bringing healing. So this is what I'm doing today. I don't get to travel around the world right now because of travel restrictions. But these are two people that inspire me to do the work that I'm doing. And even meeting with you today, all of you today on Zoom, I feel like I'm traveling through, you know, these computer screens. And uh, I'm coming to you in the spirit of Grandmother Margarita and uh, Grandfather William. Now, this is a quote. Um, I'm going to read it. And then maybe, you know, you, you can have a discussion, a discussion about it sometime. Um, but I love this quote. It says, before a child speaks. So before we speak, you know, and learn our language, whatever our language is, we sing. And, and if you look at babies or young people, maybe you have little siblings or cousins or, you know, someone in your family or maybe just a neighborhood, uh, someone in your neighborhood as a little baby, you watch a baby and they're making sounds all the time. They're not talking and going, hey, how's it going? They're mostly just going bop, 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 or, you know, making sounds. So it's like they're singing. And before we can write, you know, like some of you know how to write now, the easier thing you go back, you think about kindergarten, we painted. I used to love finger painting, right? Like when I was little and painting, right? And as soon as we could stand, and I even see babies sometimes hold, pulling themselves up in their cribs or up on furniture and they, they start dancing around, you know? So we, we have this need to dance and to sing and to paint. And it says that arts is the basis of our human expression, which just simply means that us singing and dancing and painting and, you know, maybe somebody does other things like you can do creative things like, um, you know, cooking, just being creative is part of who we are as, as human beings, as, you know, boys and girls or young people. Um, it's part of our identity and our connection again to source, to creator, to God, to something bigger than ourselves. And this is a painting that one of my uh, students that I work with, work with, I go up to James Bay, I just got back on the weekend. And um, I go to James Bay. So maybe one day your teachers can show you on the map. It's just below Hudson's Bay. Um, and it's uh, a community, a Cree community. 
Uh, and I've been going there for almost three years and I work with students, high school students that come from, you know, situations that are really, really challenging. Um, and, you know, I won't get into it too much today and maybe that's a discussion for another time. Uh, but a lot of my students that I work with, their parents, their grandparents went to residential school and um, they still are struggling because in those schools, um, it was very, very hard on them. And, um, and so the students are still that I work with that are high school students from age 12 to about, you know, 17. But then I also see sometimes young students, but the students I mostly work with are 12 to 17 and they're trying to heal. Because sometimes, very sadly, their parents didn't find love. They didn't have love in those residential schools. And then they grew up and they had their own children. And they didn't, they don't know how to love. They don't know they're struggling. And so my, the, the 12 to 17 year olds that I work with up north, they're trying to find it, figure out, well, how is it to feel love? What does it mean to be loved? Um, so I work with them on that. Um, the other thing that I do is um, I work in the uh, Toronto District School Boards and we've done big murals. So I've been asked to come in and do murals. And this is one that I was working on. I'm a, hired as an Indigenous artist and I work, these are, this is a high school that um, hired me to come and do this beautiful mural on the creation. And so um, it, it was quite a large, large piece you can see here. And this is what the painting that I mostly did myself. I, I had some help with this. And then I got the students to create little creatures like the winged ones, which are birds, the four leggeds, which can be bears or wolves or anything, the creepy crawlies, which are bugs. And they all made them out of paper mache and then we glued them to it so this is just a student here you can see working on the water um and this is just a painting i did this is one of my paintings and just to show you that i get inspired by the students that i work with up north and just showing again if you look at this painting she's holding a heart so working from the heart and also how the bees work together um, to create something you know like the honey you know and, and the food for the queen bee and that we need to work together in one common goal um, Here's a um, little slide on doing some clay, and we're going to be looking at a bit of working with clay today. And um, I'll just quickly go through these two. The, this is a field that I work in. As I said, I'm working in expressive arts therapy. And this woman here, she, she passed away in 2015. Um, she is one of the mothers or creators of expressive arts therapy and how expressive arts therapy works is like I said earlier, we don't care if you're a good artist, if you make beautiful things, not to see that your things are beautiful, but just saying that the goal isn't about making an amazing piece. It's about being expressive having fun with it. And we're going to explore that very soon about getting into the clay, not worrying about what it's going to look like. And so this woman, and I'll show you a couple of other people, they believe this uh, back in the 1970s, late, late 1960s and 70s, that, hey, we're noticing that when people make art, they feel better. As long as you don't get into being hard on yourself, going, oh, my horse doesn't look like a horse, doesn't matter. But when you're just creating and having fun and exploring, right, there was something that was making people feel better. And so they created this field called expressive arts therapy. So there was Natalie, 
And then this man, Sean McNiff, um, he is out of um, the United States around Massachusetts area. And he is another person that is bringing this idea to, um, to the world. And then this man, Paolo Nil, and he passed away last year. Um, and he was a musician. And he would, you know, get people that normally didn't make music and get everybody together and just play with sound and voice. And he would play piano and we could move to it. We could make sounds to it. We could do little vocal pieces together. And I'm telling you, it's very freeing. So I encourage everyone to, um, to find a way of expressing their self every day. And finally, um, I'll just show you a couple of my pieces. This is a painting I did on forgiveness. Um, just to show that, you know, one of the things that has helped me feel better is going back to painting. It is part of my healing. It makes me feel good. Um, it's relaxing. Uh, I don't care what it looks like at the end. I just get into using color and shape. And I really enjoy that. And here's another one of my paintings and it's talking about how our hands when you're an artist they're like they're magical right because our hands think of a life without hands right and some people they go through their life they learn how to to not have those hands and they some people do really well if they've had an accident or a birth defect but just showing the power of our hands you know like how we can you know we can hold a paintbrush or we can mold clay, which we're going to find out. So the hands to me are, are such a great tool and that we, we honor them and we honor that, that magic and that medicine that can be come out of them when it's especially connected to our heart. And then this is a, a quote. Um, I'm just going to read it. it it's, um, and maybe, you know, uh, this is, you know, could be used for a discussion in a classroom. Um, and it just says that in many shamanic societies, so what that means is that in the Indigenous world, um, not only Indigenous, but we're going to use the Indigenous um, world, there were medicine people, shamans that you would go to when you weren't feeling good, when you might have been sick, phys your body was sick. You felt sick in your heart. You were sad. You were lonely. Or maybe in your mind, you weren't thinking clearly. So these people we would go to, and we still have them today around the world, to get help. It's not like a doctor where you're just going to get maybe a diagnosis. This is someone that would help you heal. So it says that in many shamanic societies, if you came to a medicine person, okay, and you were complaining of being disheartened, dispirited, or depressed. Okay, so like I said, just not feeling good. They would ask you four questions. Number one, when did you stop dancing? Number two, when did you stop singing? Number three, when did you stop being enchanted by stories? Like just telling stories and really loving to hear like, oh, your story when you went on vacation or you went to, you know, you did something special with your family or with a friend or somebody and you sit and you listen to the story. And then the fourth question was, when did you stop finding comfort in the sweet territory of silence? And what that means to me is that you know, we're always so busy in this life and we're always like on our devices and got headphones on or watching stuff on YouTube or TikTok or whatever. Well, what this is saying, sometimes it's really, really good for our mind. And we're talking about mindfulness to just sit in the quiet. I love going out for a walk in nature and I listen to the wind or I live by a lake here and sometimes I hear the water hitting the shore 
And that is very calming for me. So that's my little, um, yeah, my little um, PowerPoint. And um, I just want to see if, um, if anything's come up, Carly, before I move into the grandfather teachings. I know we're... <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, nothing yet. So let's okay. work ahead. Okay, thank you. All right. So like I said, you know, uh, when I showed the PowerPoint about Grandfather William, um, about my teachings working from the heart, and um, there's something that is called the seven grandfather teachings. And I just want to go through these. And we're going to between each one, we're going to take a little time in the classroom to reflect a bit with your teachers. Okay, so one of the first teachings, because um, there's seven is um, is respect. I hope everyone can see that okay on the camera there. Am I holding it at a good distance, Carly? Yes, that looks great. Okay, so respect. So I'm going to tell you what I think respect is, and then we're going to just take a little pause and let you have a few minutes, you know, a couple of minutes, not too long in your classrooms. Um, because we want to get through the teachings and then we're going to make an art piece. Um, so just on what respect. And to me, this is such an important part of, you know, a teaching because we need to respect each other. And we always are told as, as children, especially, oh, respect your parents, respect your elders, you know, respect your grandparents. And that's true. We do. Because when we respect people, we are, um, you know, we are putting them in a position where we see them as very important for us, right? And that, but the thing is, is that we also need respect ourselves as children, you know, and that it's important that we respect each other. So I always, I don't care what age you are, you know, whether you're, you know, like a baby or an elderly person, I show the same respect. The other thing too about respect is that we are all sacred beings. And that means that in the indigenous way that we come from the creator, we come from, you know, God, whatever you want to call, um, you know, a higher being, or again, it could be nature right? We come, we are made of the same materials as Mother Earth and even the stars. So we are sacred and that demands respect. And so we have to always ask ourselves before we speak to someone or we enter, we go and work with someone, is this respectful? Am I showing respect? So I'm just going to give you a moment there. And you can pause here and just have a little dialogue about what does respect mean to me. Okay, so another teaching that is really important is courage, having courage. And boy, have we needed it this last almost two years, right? Because there's a lot of very scary things that have been going on on the planet. And um, so courage is represented by the bear. And I'm actually from the bear clan. And the bear is about being a protector of family, right? And so courage, we need to be courageous. And the reason why is that life, can make can show up with some very scary things could be COVID, it could be one of our family members gets sick. Or maybe, you know, sadly, we're being bullied at school. I, I've been bullied when I was at school when I was little. And you know, it took me courage to get off that school bus sometimes. But courage is, you know, a way of being planted in the in the ground we say when we want to be have courage we need to feel our feet right planted on on mother earth and feel all of her energy coming up into us and making us strong you know 
and always placing one foot in front of the other. It's not to say that it's bad to be scared sometimes. Of course, you know, we all get scared, right? It's just that we have to sometimes find the strength that even if we're feeling scared to try something, okay? I mean, I know that uh, even it takes courage to make art. If you think, oh my gosh, I'm not good at this, or I don't know how to sing, or I, I don't, you know, we have to stand and say, I'm going to try this. I'm going to be brave. I'm going to have courage and I'm going to try something new. And I'll tell you, most times when I tell people about finding their courage, a lot of the time they come back to me and they're like, oh my gosh, Val, thank you for making me take a risk to be courageous because I did finally try that. Or I went on this trip that I was scared to fly on a plane or you know, whatever it is, right? And they, because they took a risk, because they tried it, they actually enjoyed it. And they thought, wow, I would have never known that if I wouldn't have been brave, if I wouldn't have had the courage to go and try something new. So you can maybe discuss now, what does courage mean to you? Okay, so humility, I always ask this question, you know, and it's hard sometimes, because this isn't really a word that's used a lot, and especially when we're young. And it's like, what is humility? What is being humble, right? So I always like to say the story, or um, if you, you know, ran a race, and you came in first, and you won the trophy, right? What would you do? You know, how would you behave? What would you say? Would you say, hi, I'm better than everybody? Ha ha ha, right? You know, like I won, I'm first, right? Or even being in the music business, which I've been, you know, there's a lot of competition in that business, like, you know, winning the awards or, you know, um, yeah, winning, you know, music awards. And so what I always say about humility is that to learn that we might be really good at something, but it doesn't mean we're better than anybody. Because in the Indigenous way of knowing and being, we believe that we're all equal. We all bring different gifts. Maybe you're good at math. Maybe you are good at, you know, art or a sport, soccer, hockey. Um, maybe those are your gifts. Um, I'm not good at hockey. I'm not, I've never been good at soccer. Those aren't my gifts. I'm more, you know, I know what my gifts are, are mostly in the arts. But the point is, is that if you're good at something, you're good at that. It does not mean you're better than other people. Because I'll just finish by saying that you might win the race today and come in first and get the trophy, but maybe next week you come in fourth, right? And so it just means you won the race that day. And so we need to be humble. It's okay to, to feel good. Hey, I won the race today and I got the trophy, you know, and enjoy that moment, right? Because I've, you know, we, we all have our moments where we're, we get excited because we win something or, you know, or someone says, hey, you know, that was really awesome what you did up there. I really like your art piece or I love how you sang that song, right? And it's, it's okay to, to, to say, oh, thank you. That was, you know, thanks. I, I really worked hard at that. But again, it's just humility is about you are not better a better person than anybody else. So this is an important one for all of us. So you can take a moment to talk about what does humility mean? What does it mean to be humble? Okay, so we're on to our fourth teaching, which is wisdom. And this is such an, I find this a really almost magical card, magical teaching, I should say, because we always think when we think of wisdom, we think, oh, it's older people, 
You know, like when we get older, we have more life experience. We know things that maybe someone who's quite young doesn't know. And it's true. I mean, because I have lived, you know, uh, 57 years, that's how old I am. Yeah, I'm, I might know some things that some of you younger people don't know, but it doesn't mean that you don't have wisdom. Because in the Indigenous um, teachings, we believe that we are born with this wisdom from the Creator. And that's why sometimes you can hear children, and maybe some of you there, where children will say the wisest things. You know, they'll say something or, you know, give, and, and you're just like, you know, you you're almost stand back and go, wow. That's amazing, like that they thought that, or they might have advice, or they might say something that really makes you think, right? So I just want you to know that we are born with this uh, deeper knowing called wisdom that comes from, you know, the creator. And so just because you're young, right? Just don't think that you aren't wise. And I always listen to sometimes my students up north, they, I try to tell them and, and get them to see the wisdom that they carry inside. So you might want to take a couple of minutes and maybe reflect with your teacher like, you know, what do I know? What are some of the wise things I know in my life? Even if I'm young, like there are some teachings, some things that you know that are very uh, important teachings. Okay. So we're coming to our fifth teaching, which is the truth. And I'm going to do them separately, but I just want you to see there's something called truth and something called honesty, right? So truth, again, it kind of goes to me with that wisdom that truth is something that we're born with. It comes from the creator. It, we know, and I know, okay, when we tell a lie, you know, and we all do it, okay? You got to ask yourself, how do I feel? And I would say most of us, if not everyone, or, you know, most people, when we lie, we make something up and we all do it. So we can feel icky, like we don't feel good, right? And it's because the truth is one of those gifts, like all these teachings that come from the creator, right? So if we are truthful, if we, st and also truth is about who you are, right? So we all have our own truth. So some of us might, you know, say, um, you know, I'm against hurting animals, right? And, and then we see, you know, we see them and they say that and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm really, you know, against anybody hurting any kind of animals. And then we see that person, that same person hitting a dog with a stick, you know, and then we're like, wait a minute. I thought, you know, he said, or she said that they weren't into hurting animals. They're not really standing in their truth. So when we stand in our truth, whatever it is, Right. And this is what's important, especially when we get a bit older, like teenage years. This is where we can start having we can start teetering in our truth and kind of get peer pressure. But then we go home and we're thinking, you know, I didn't really want to do that with my friends because that's not really who I am. You know, so it's a matter of standing in the truth and again, feeling anchored to you know, the creator to be anchored into mother earth and standing in our own. And, and it is about courage. We talked about courage or, earlier and being in our truth takes courage. Okay. And then we have honesty. So honesty is 
about how, what we say to each other, right? Like truth is about being true to ourself. Like who am I? What's important to me? No, I don't want to do that. Cause you know, I'm going to use an example. Like I remember being, you know, in grade seven, I think, and people were, you know, skipping school and, I'm, you know, and I wouldn't want to do it. Right. And I had to learn that even though I would be told, oh, you, you know, you're, we had names, like we called it square back then, which meant you weren't cool. You weren't going along with your friends. Um, and then I would feel, you know, bad because I'd have my, my friends wanting me to do it, but then I would be like, no, I don't want to do this, you know? So being honest is what we say to each other, how we communicate. And sometimes it's hard because, you know, even as adults, you know, we have a hard time always being honest. And it, it does, again, take courage to be honest, you know, to say things like if somebody hurt you, right, and you have to tell them, you know, I, I'm really hurt by that. You know, it takes courage. But being honest, again, makes us feel free because we're not holding things in. So maybe you could take a moment here and just you know, look at, you know, the difference between truth and honesty. Again, truth is standing for yourself and what you believe in. And honesty is how we communicate to each other. Okay, the last teaching, and it's my favorite, <laughs> um, is the love teaching. Because to me, at the end of the day, this is really what we all need and want in our lives. And love is healing. This is like medicine, you know, is that when we feel loved, okay, when, and it's not, you know, for what we look like or that we did an amazing painting or we, you know, won the goals at the hockey game or whatever, right? We need to feel loved just because of we're here, you know, and that's remember when I showed you grandfather William and grandmother Margarita, that's what they talk about is that we need to feel love just because we are part of the human sacred family. Doesn't matter if you're, you know, got, beautiful hair and beautiful clothes or or you come from a family like you know that doesn't have a lot of money doesn't matter we are all spiritual beings that are needing and deserving of love so i work very much with this to show people that the, how important it is. And just to finish, and we're going to make our start our little art project. Um, you can also learn to love yourself, right? And that love is all around us, you know, and it's hard to imagine that. But I, I tell people sometimes because they're like, no, I don't feel love. My mom, you know, these are my students up north are like my mom. She's too depressed to to love. I don't feel love from her. And I always tell my students, look around. Doesn't, doesn't only have to come from your mom or your family, but look out when you see, you know, like the, the sunrise coming up or the sunset. Look at the beauty, the love in that, you know. So it's all around us. And again, you know, I try to teach everyone about loving ourselves. And, it, and it's a bit of work, but it's important. To say, you know what? I do love myself. And I don't have to always have people tell me they love me. What's important is that when I look in the mirror or when I'm in my own thoughts, in my own mind, that I love myself. So that's, like I said, to me, 
one of the, if not the most important. And when we bring love to each other, and it's love can be like kindness, it can be just being caring, you don't have to buy anything, you just show kindness and love, the world becomes a much nicer place. Okay, so those are the seven grandfather teachings. So what we're going to do now for the time being is we're going to take our clay. I've got some uh, little clay here. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to make a heart shape because like I said, you don't have to make the heart, but I always like to use the heart because I think of love, remember, because I think if we can all work, you know, whether we're you know, a teacher, whether we're um, someone like me, a therapist, a, a policeman, I mean, anybody, you know, if we work from a place of love, you know, it will help transform the world. So what I'm asking you to do is to just take your clay, okay, and you can make a heart shape and you make it the way you do because you don't have to look at the person next to you. Like you make it because you're unique. You are your own person, right? Doesn't matter. Make your own shape, whatever it looks like to you. you can do a heart. All right. And then I'm going to ask you, and maybe your teachers, if they could take a quick minute and write on a board somewhere for you, and I'll, I'll read them out. Um, you know, somewhere where all of you can see the seven teachings. And then what I'm going to get everyone to do is to choose one of the seven teachings and write it on your clay. Okay, so I want you to reflect. Okay, so don't rush it. Okay, let it, let's see which one of these teachings spoke to you the most. Maybe it was the love teaching. Or the courage. Maybe you're like, hey, I want to be more courageous in my life, you know, because I want to learn to stand up for myself a bit more. Maybe because, you know, sadly, you know, like I said, bullying does happen. But I'll tell you something that's very interesting. What I've learned is most bullies, what they're really looking for is love because they don't feel love. So sometimes, the best way to for us to work with bullying is to show love. I'm not saying you accept that if they're physically harming you. I'm just saying, you know, I, um, I remember when I was in high school, my adopted father, I didn't really tell you that part of me, but I was actually adopted and found my birth mother later. But my adopted father was uh dying he he had terminal cancer and i was grade uh nine and i had this one girl in grade nine i don't know again don't know why but she she did not like me we never had a problem but you know how some bullying goes right they just don't like you it's like they didn't like how i looked or who knows right it's in their head and she she um was bullying me and scaring me and so one day when she had me kind of cornered in a hallway and was going to, I don't know what she was going to do, yell at me or whatever. I told her, I said, I, I, I stood up. I found courage and the truth. And I said, you know, cause here I was cornered. I said, um, I just want you to know that, you know, my father is at home and he's not very well. And I'm really not, you know, I'm having a hard time and you're scaring me. And, you know, and I just spoke my truth and I, I was shaking. I was scared in that moment, but I spoke from my heart. And you know what? She like transformed. And it was like this love thing came over her and compassion. It was almost like, like a spell came over and she became you know, someone that really cared for me and looked out for me. It was such an amazing experience at that age. But I always thought after that, 
we got like a heart connection. She found compassion. And then, and then because I didn't, I forgave her, you know, and understood her, it was such a beautiful moment. Um, so that's something I was hold to get hold in my heart and in my spirit. So anyway, so this is, you know, what it, what it could look like. This is mine. You know, this is an idea of what it looks like. Okay. And then, you know, you just reflect and, um, and you can write in, you can decorate it too. So I take a moment while you're doing it. I don't know how well you'll see mine, but I don't know if you can all see that, but I wrote truth. Because right now, truth is really important for me. Hey, Valerie, as the students are working on their clay and reflection, there is a question that came up in the chat, if you have one minute to answer it. Um, the question is, is there an animal that represents wisdom? Oh, is there an animal? Um, it's, it's an elder. So whatever an elder can look like to, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Well, you know, you can make your own symbols too. So, I mean, there are some that come with the teachings, but, you know, as I've worked with students, they decorate their piece however they want. Um, because what, as I said earlier, what's important is, you know, what is meaningful to you, who you are, who you unique, uniquely are, so. And there's a little quote on here while you're working. You don't, you can keep working everyone, but I just want you to hear this. I love this quote on the love card. It says to know love is to know peace. And that makes a lot of sense for me. Um, because when we feel love to each other, you know, showing kindness, as I said earlier, when I shared that story about my high school experience, um, it is more peaceful, you know, when we're fighting with someone, it, it's, it's not fun. It, it doesn't feel good. You're, you live with fear. You live with, um, you know, you, you have stress in your body. Um, so it's, you know, it's something, it's not an easy thing. The world has a lot of work to do on this. Um, but I think it's something if we are mindful about it and these, teachings let them be part of your mindfulness you know and there's the different versions of the story of like how did these you know why are these teachings um you know so important and they've been around a while and there was one of the uh cre creation stories of the grandfather teachings is that at the time in the world the world was in, in a very chaotic space, just kind of like today, right? It's almost like funny that what we're going today, there was warring, there were wars, there was uh, hatred. Human beings were really not, we were not in a good space. And so the ancestors that were in the spirit world, you know, they 
saw us struggling and they were worried about us thinking they're not going to make it down there. They're not going to make it. So they decided that one way was to bring these teachings to humanity as part of helping us to be better to each other and be better ourselves. But they thought, well, how are we going to get these teachings down to the earthlings, to the human beings, to the two leggeds? So there was a boy that had these uh, this ability, young boy, probably around some of the age of, of some of you on this on this call today. And they said, we're, we're, he has this ability to go between our world and on sacred earth, Mother Earth. So they sent him with the seven grandfather teachings. Because a child, when you're young, you know, there's this, this pure wisdom and innocence that can come, you know, because sadly, for some of us as adults, we can lose that. We can lose that innocence and we can. So they sent this boy to Mother Earth with um, the seven grandfather teachings. So that's the version I know. So I don't know, Carly, if there's any other comments or questions. We're getting near the end today, but. Yeah, it feels like everybody's uh, busy reflecting and, and having mindful moments in their classroom. So I think we'll just take this time to say goodbye. Valerie, it was a total honor to meet you and to work with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really lucky to have you today. Um, my friends in your classrooms, if you feel willing, please share photos of your clay hearts with us when they're done. I would love to see them. I know Valerie would too. You can email them to us. You have our email address or you can tag us on social media at Jube School. Thank you so much. Join us again next week for more Mindful November. Valerie, thank you so much. Don't forget yeah. to love one another, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much.